now after the pandemic? Yes. What do we do with online learning and blended learning? So rather than going back to the way things were before, how do we think about online and blended learning as a strategic part of the mix of mm. what we need to be doing as giving educational systems very much needed flexibility and resilience. Good afternoon, Doctor, and uh, thank you for having you here in uh, Siem Reap Province, Cambodia, at our uh, Tomei Tomei office. And uh, I mean, Doctor, I mean, as a, an expert and a specialist in uh, digital education, uh, you've been working in that field for a very long time in, I, as I was informed, in multiple places in the world and especially in the US. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you have been traveling, I mean, uh, far, I mean, a very lengthy trip from the U.S. to Cambodia, so <laughs> in Phnom Penh and also in uh, Siem Reap. Yeah. So can you tell me uh, in those uh, places a few days ago and today also in Siem Reap, um, what did you share to the Cambodian people about your expertise? So I've been meeting with um, various universities, public schools, pub private institutions, teacher education schools, um, to talk about, first of all, the idea of now after the pandemic, yes. what do we do with online learning and blended learning? So rather than going back to the way things were before, how do we think about online and blended learning as a strategic part of the mix of mm. what we need to be doing as giving educational systems very much needed flexibility and resilience? So instead of simply moving past online learning, how can we fold that into the education that we're doing? Along with that, if we're going to do online, how do we do that well? Um, so of course, during the pandemic, there was a very quick rush mm. to online learning. People had to move very quickly. They didn't have time to build great online learning. The system, the Many infrastructure. Many folks were frustrated, right? So if we're going to do that well in a meaningful way, then how do we do that? And what does research have to tell us about how to do that well? So the institution in concern are the private sectors, the public school, the... All the, of them. All, all right. of them, yes. Um, all the way from um, how do they do it themselves mm. to how do they prepare teachers, how do they teach their kids, so um, all different conversations. So yes, uh, Doctor, I mean, rewind back for, let's say, a couple of years back to COVID. So, I mean, I know that digitalization in education sector has been, you know, a prioritized, I mean, a priority for, for developing, for developed and developing countries around right. the world. Right. But is it uh, during the COVID it's itself that, you know, every country take digitalization in education, you know, more seriously than ever before? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as you said, we certainly saw online learning and digital education before the pandemic. Yes. I mean, research on online learning dates back over 20 years. Um, so, and I've been de designing and teaching online myself for over 20 years, but it wasn't really until during the pandemic that mm. we had so many schools and institutions and countries co even considering online. Now, since the pandemic, um, we, there's been a definite marked increase in student demand for online learning. So schools and institutions are having to respond to that demand as well. So we're definitely seeing an increase in long-term online learning after the pandemic. So it means that in the US, for example, during COVID, mm -hmm. students were, let's say, put out of their comfort zone right. in order to study online. And, right. and it's, it's quite a surprise for them also. Uh, right. can, can you elaborate on that? I mean, the, the inner working of the society. Sure, yeah. for K-12, so younger learners, yes. that was a very big shift. Most K-12 online learning is not online. Um. So for all of those children moving online, that was a very significant change. Now for college students, there's more online offerings in the U.S. online at the undergraduate, so for a bachelor's degree, it's less common, but we have a lot of students who take online certificates, mm. online masters, you know, other learning opportunities. Um, and a lot of states in the U.S. actually have a requirement that high school students have to have taken at least one online class mm -hmm. before they graduate, so they at least have some experience in yes. online learning. So there was some experience with that, but not to the scale that we experienced during, during, during COVID-19, yes. Yeah, right. And yes, doctor, I mean, 
I mean, I myself was uh, also, you know, experiencing a lot of difficulties. Uh, a good, a good two years of my university life. Right. Um, but I, I noticed there's, a, you know, there's a small like difficulty when when we say that online learning, mm -hmm. the teacher actually just like stream, you know, the mm -hmm. way he teach or right. she, yeah, like right. just just like the plain old right. traditional teaching, but through screen. Right. Or, you know, sometimes there might be, you know, let's say automatic system that you do it yourself. So when you say online learning, mm -hmm. what do you mean exactly? Like that traditional way, but That's on a, a screen? <laughs> that is such a lovely question because yeah, yes. I, we, those of us who work in online learning often say education does not equal content. So just delivering content is not enough. That's not an education. It's purely content. Education and learning involves wrapping strategies around that yes. to help students learn the content, to help them apply that, to help them see the connections to their jobs. So when I teach online learning, um, if I present content, it's always recorded and provided to students asynchronously. Yes, yes. When we're together in a live online class like on Zoom, usually we're doing teamwork, group work. I may have students demonstrating things to me, showing me, you know, okay, I've asked you to do X, show me how you do that. Okay, based on what I'm seeing, here's some feedback that I have for you. So online learning includes interaction, yes. includes building social uh, community, social connections with students. Um, we use um, a three-legged or a three-pronged approach focus on three types of uh, interaction. Yes, yes. Learner content interaction, learner to learner interaction, and learner to instructor interaction. So what you're describing is purely about learner to content. How can learners receive content? That's not enough. We have to also facilitate learners interacting with each other, sharing knowledge, collaborating, working together, we also have to facilitate learners interacting with the instructor, being mm. able to ask questions, um, ask for clarification, um, having me actually provide supportive, constructive feedback so they can improve their application of that. That's all of what I mean when I talk about online learning, not just the content. But, I mean, frankly speaking, I mean, is it hard to do it, you know, via the wireless network? I mean. It, it's, it's going to be a bit complicated, right? So, so is there anything, you know, like you, you can do to, to minimize, you know, let's say the, the misunderstanding when people talk online, you know, because face-to-face -face would be, I mean, much more preferred. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, there's definitely a misconception that face-to-face -face communication oh, okay. is perfect. Mm. Human beings miscommunicate face-to-face -face all the time. Yeah. In fact, what's funny is the more that we study online learning and online interactions, do you want to pause? Oh, it's okay, it's okay. okay. Yeah, don't, don't. Um, the more we actually start to understand human interactions and human mm. collaborations. So um, even in a face-to-face -face environment, there are a lot of times that instructors misinterpret students, yeah, misunderstand yeah. them. In fact, in online learning, we came up with a theory called transactional distance. So it's not just about the physical or geographical distance, but in every interaction, there are these distances that are intellectual, psychological, emotional. Yes, so what yes. we focus on is how do we bridge those distances with our learners? And in fact, that's what I've been sharing with schools is one of the ways online learning has changed me is I now understand that distance exists no matter where I'm at. So I'm always thinking about how do I bridge that distance? Mm. How do I build that relationship? And I apply that both online and in my face-to-face -face teaching. So normally, like I mentioned earlier, so people normally, let's say, um, they think that face-to-face -face communication would be a lot more efficient, but actually not like that. So by right. understanding that, we can embrace online learning much better right. than, than we, we did right. before. In fact, I feel like I know my students better yes. online, and we hear this from teachers that make this transition to online mm. teaching that, especially as they change their practices, and it does become a really significant change to one's teaching practices, but instead of me focusing my time on delivering content, I, let, I record everything, I let the computer and automate all of that. 
So I'm no longer just the content delivery vehicle. That allows me to spend my time reading students' work, getting mm. to know them. So now instead of simply delivering content and giving a test, I actually ha have my students watch and read on their own. Yes. And then when we meet, I have them bring their work to me and I evaluate their work. I know my students' strengths and weaknesses better, and I'm able to give them a lot more feedback for continuous improvement throughout a class. So I, I hardly even use tests anymore. Mm. I use a lot of assignments and submissions from students, and I have them break it down into multiple deliverables, so I really know what do they understand, what do they not understand, and how can I give them feedback to help them develop. So I feel like I get to know my students a lot more. And again, we hear this from other instructors. We also hear that from our students. Um, one of my students shared that uh, she had done her bachelor's degree in yes. person oh. at the university. And then she did her master's degree online with us. And after she completed her master's online, she said, I actually felt like I got to know my fellow students and my instructors so much better in the online program than I did face to face. That's because of how we designed our online program. We intentionally designed it to facilitate a lot of that interaction I was telling you about. Students were interacting with each other all the time and they were interacting with us as instructors all the time. But, uh, yes, doctor, but in, in that case, I mean, even though we interact a lot on, on you know, the virtual world, I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it is still the virtual world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also have, you know, my, my own personal uh, experience in my university is that sometimes, uh, or, or maybe, uh, that, was, uh, that, that was because I didn't take the online, you know, thinking to the limit. Mm -hmm. But there is a small, you know, difficulty that we don't interact with each other, you know, the, the human to human way and sometimes the professors and uh, you know other instructors do not know us very well talking to us you know via the screen so do you think that that you know by embracing embracing the, the you know online education online learning will it jeopardize you know the, the friendship you know the physical contact no i don't because but that's not been my experience oh, okay. that's not been the experience and also research doesn't bear that out so um, the way to think about it from both experience and research yes. is that it's not the technology, it's the design. So you can have a poorly designed online learning experience. Yes. yes. You can also have a poorly designed face-to-face -face learning experience. And students will tell you they've been in classes where they don't get to know their peers, they don't get to know the instructor, they mm. simply show up, sit, receive their content, go away right? It's all about how we design it. So I can design a very interactive online learning experience or I can design one that's not interactive at all. I can design one where I get to know my students, where we all get to know each other and we do develop those relationships or I can design a class where we don't. So I'm, I know folks have experienced online learning where that hasn't happened. Yes, yes. It's not a function of online or the technology it's a function of the way that the instruction has been designed. So, now so for the yeah, pandemic, yeah, yes, what happened was so many people had to put stuff online mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm. When we develop quality online learning, it takes months to put that together, mm. not weeks. <laughs> In <laughs> yeah. fact, for high quality on online learning, you usually want your course designed and structured so that on the first day that you deliver your class, it's all set in stone. There was no way for faculty, for teachers to do that during the pandemic. Mm. What that also meant is folks learned some really bad habits about how to do online learning. So I feel like the conversation right now is actually helping instructors break some bad habits around online learning so it can be more effective, more social. Yes, uh, Doctor, but to an average, you know, Cambodian audience is watching the video, they might get a bit, let's say, not really I mean, not, not a very clear understanding on, on what you might say a well-designed and a well-structured online learning. So uh -huh. can you give like one or two examples? I mean, sure. what, what, what is that exactly? Yes. Sure. Okay. So for well-designed online learning, first of all, we start by breaking it down very carefully. 
what content is going to be delivered, when is that going to happen, what are the strategies that we're going to use to engage students with that content. Mm -hmm. So instead of just reading or watching videos, what do I want you doing with that content? Maybe I want you working out a math problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe Good. I want you developing a business plan as part of your class. Maybe if you're a teacher, I want you developing a lesson plan. I want you to show me how are you applying what you're learning. And then they might, students turn in that assignment and we would provide them feedback. Now, I teach classes that are asynchronous and I also teach classes that are both synchronous and asynchronous. It really depends on the learners. But for the classes that are asynchronous, we have a lot of discussions going. The way that I structure my discussions are not simply tell me about what you read, but I might give my students a case study or a scenario and say, I want you to take what you read and I want you to apply it to this. And I mm -hmm. want you to analyze that and really dig into this. And then we're gonna share our responses and come up with a joint response. Or I might have students working together in a group project where I want them to develop a product or resource together. Um, other times I have students working independently on independent projects, say, you know, teachers who are putting together lesson plans, they need to do that independently, but I'll still put them in groups so they can share ideas with each mm. other and also give each other feedback on that. And then once they do the peer feedback, then it gets submitted to me and I provide them my feedback. So another feature is that a well-organized online course is laid out first day to last day. So if you think about how you do all of your planning for videos and everything, you know exactly what you're gonna do, you have your process, we do the same thing for online, especially when we support folks developing that. So we sit down and we come up with a plan for what are you doing week by week, day mm. by day, we put all of that together so that it's in place by the time everything goes live. We also build in a lot of other supports for students. A lot of students don't know how to be good online learners. So it's something we call self-regulation. So we build orientations for students. You mean self-discipline to be? Uh, self-discipline yeah. is a good word for yeah, that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, it's also like managing their environment for learning, managing their own, learn, understanding themselves as learners better, what's effective for them, how do they manage their time. So we actually teach students how to do all of that as part of the online learning process. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of elements. In fact, when we studied, uh, studied online learning, the tendency is to compare face-to-face -face as, as if it's just a room versus a computer. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. very simplistic view of it. Okay. There's okay. so many different variables that go into designing effective instruction, both in the classroom and online. In fact, for online, we've identified at least 33 variables so far that all influence the quality of the experience and the effectiveness of it. Those are a lot of decision points. So if you don't know some of those, you don't know how to make them, of course a class is not gonna be that great. My first class I took as an online student was awful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I never thought yes. I would be sitting here talking with you about this. But I've definitely learned over time and we've studied this over time and we have very reliable techniques and strategies for how to make it more effective, more social, more satisfactory. Yes, Doctor, but so, so if I put it uh, as the way I, I understand it, so the online way that we learn during COVID it's mm. not. It's not really the best it's one so really far great. because no. you know the, all of the hectic and the shortcomings. Right. But the, the the online learning that we design for the future will be not like this one anymore. I yeah. hope, yeah. and that's what I hope my conversations help folks with. Yes, is yes. how to move past online learning and what it looked like in the pandemic to what it really should be and can be if we design it well.